reading from the 11th, or 17th chapter of Luke. Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. He went into a village and ten men with leprosy met him. They stood off at a distance and called out, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice and threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. This was a Samaritan. Jesus said, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? No one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner. Then he said to the man, rise, go. Your faith has made you whole. The word from the Lord in the house of the Lord. Yeah. The prophet wrote a letter to the Jewish people in Babylon who were in exile and said, God said, get to living. Marry, have children, have them marry, plant gardens, build houses, live. And that's the advice he gives to most of us all the time, that sometimes we have trouble getting into. He wants you to live life, not exist. He wants you to live life wholly, fully, absolutely, not just put in your time. doesn't want us to just coast. He wants us to be fully, absolutely committed to living the life that he has in store for us. Jesus went into a village walking the line between Samaria and Galilee, between two people who hated each other. The Samaritans so hated the Jews that if one of them happened to walk across his land, he would take hands full of straw and place them every footprint that the Jew had left, and then he would light them a fire to rid his land of any, any residue of having a Jew on their land. And yet they went to Jesus the Jew to be healed. And one in ten came back to tell Jesus, thank you, thank you for doing what you did for me. And Jesus looked around with, I thought I did ten. Where are the other nine? You know, it's kind of, we, we, we all recognize that God creates miracles in our lives. He, he does things in our lives, but we've got... We've gotten an attitude over the years of, yeah, but what have you done for me lately, God? We expect good things all the time. And if we can't identify those good things, I've told you the story before that I went off to a sales meeting in May. And at the sales meeting, they said, we sold our product line. You have one week to turn in your company car. I was off to, to celebrate because... We're going to have a sales meeting. We always ate really good at the sales meeting. He just dismissed us even before lunch. Now, you know that I, I have a love affair with food. And it broke my heart to be cut off. Suddenly, there were, there were five of us reps. Four of us didn't have jobs. What a terrible thing for God to do to me. I had it all planned. Ten more years I would retire and I would never have to work again because everything would be so wonderful. And I got fired. <laughs> fired right into a better job. I don't know that, that I convinced Nancy that it was a better job. When I, when I got to go home and tell her that I was going to take a job that paid almost 25% of what I used to make, that didn't set real well right off the bat. And not only that, I didn't tell her this, but she found out later. I wasn't going to work 10 more years. <laughs> or 20 more years. More like, who knows? The Samaritan had the, had the compassion for those around him to come back and say, thank you for what you did to me, God that I might be able to do for other people, that I might be able to make a difference in another life or two. Even though they were different nationalities, even though they, they had grown up with a hatred for each other. No, only a hatred one way, because Jesus doesn't hate anybody. 
But the Samaritan hated him until he needed him. The Samaritan hated Jesus before he knew him. The Samaritan hated all the Jews, so he must have hated him. We have to be careful that we don't so prejudge, so, so completely get prejudiced that we are unavailable for the wonderful mercies and the wonderful gifts that God can give to us if we simply make the commitment to need him. Now, we have all sorts of things go on in our lives. Sometimes they're really tough to handle and sometimes we don't understand why we are so blessed. But we ought to be one out of the ten that has the courage to stop and say, oh, thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for me in my life. Because my life is different than it would have been without it. My life is different than if the circumstances hadn't put me where I am. I didn't plan on being your pastor. When I came to, to this part of the world to retire and live off my wife, I mean, no, excuse me. She wasn't supposed to be here today. I, think. Uh, I thought I had a life of ease and wasn't going to have to do much of anything from now on. And I had no intention because I was told that we don't use local pastors in this conference. Yeah, they don't. We know better than that. But when I look back and I begin to realize how many times the things that I thought in my life were tragic, the things that I thought in my life were disaster, have simply set me up to be closer to him, to be closer to the one who could love me enough to overcome all of the things in my life that have gone the way they shouldn't. And that doesn't mean everything's perfect. We have some, you know, we always have situations that come up. But he reminds us that he's never very far away from us. We don't have to do this alone. We have him on our side. But we have to be at least that one in ten who understands what he's done for us. That one in ten who can take time out of their life to praise him for what he has done in our life. Yeah, one in ten. It's a pretty bad batting average. It's a pretty bad average for almost anything. Except it has to be us who is the one. The one in ten. The prophet wrote to the people in exile and said, God says, live your life. You're in exile. Live your life where you are. Be who you are, where you are, because that's what is, ha what is real. But understand that God is always with you. Yeah, ten lepers came and stood off a great distance. They had to. They weren't allowed to come close to anybody. Family, friends, no. They had to live off by themselves. And he said, all you got to do is go show yourself to the priest. That'll take care of it. And the one in ten came back to say thank you for giving me a life back, a relationship back with my family, a relationship back with my city, a relationship back with the world. That he might hear the same message that those in exile heard. Live your life. We have a lot of people around us who are in exile. They're isolated because of some addiction. They're isolated because of some situation. And God says to them to live your life. But remember to be the one in ten who says, thank you, Lord, for putting me where I am that we might each be who we are. And that in being who we are, we are loved perfectly by the perfect love of Jesus Christ. Be one in ten. Not nine like most, but one that's special. One with a relationship with Christ that is meaningful, lifelong, life-giving for eternity. One in ten. Amen. Live life. 
It's what you got. Never live life alone. Be one in ten who draws near to him that you might know his peace, his joy. Amen.